الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعض فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam Brothers and sisters, respected Imam here at Surah al Muhammadiyah in Pitaling Jaya in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh Our subject tonight is an extremely interesting one a fascinating topic, an intriguing topic, a topic with which you will have to live long after listening to this lecture tonight. As we ponder and reflect over the prophecies of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam pertaining to akhir zaman the end time. Our topic is entitled, The River the river Euphrates in Arabic Furat, the river Euphrates, a mountain of coal. India, Iran, and Akhirul Zaman. India, Iran, and Akhirul Zaman. And we want to begin by pointing out that Nabi Muhammad informed us in a very famous hadith about 10 signs of Akhir zaman and these are now recognized as the 10 major signs but that's not in the hadith the word major is not there in the hadith and among these 10 there is Al-Masih Al-Dajjal or Dajjal the false messiah Someone who is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, programmed, programmed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he is an evil being. He's an evil being. And when he is released into the world, he will eventually, eventually emerge and you will see him as a human being, as a Jew, as a young man, powerfully built, curly hair, and his mission is to impersonate the true Messiah who is Nabi Isa alayhi salam, the Prophet Jesus. And since we know that Nabi Isa alayhi salam is coming back, the most powerful voice in history to have ever prophesied that Jesus, the son of Mary alayhi salam, is going to come back, is the voice of Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. And we know from the hadith of Sahih Bukhari that when he comes back, he's going to come back to rule. He would be Hakim to rule. Obviously, his rule has to be the supreme rule in the world, that there can be no other rule to challenge his rule. No, Tabulit. So he's going to come back to be the ruling force in the world. And he will rule with justice. If the Jal, the false messiah or the antichrist is to successfully impersonate the true messiah, then he will also have to try to rule the world. Is that so difficult to understand? 
and he will have to try to rule the world to convince the Jews, not the Muslims, not the Christians, not the Hindus, to convince the Jews that he is the Messiah. So he has to do that, ruling the world from Jerusalem. Is that so difficult to understand? Well, I have news for you tonight. He's almost there. He doesn't have much to do again. <laughs> There's only a little bit left for him to accomplish his mission of ruling the world from Jerusalem. My book, which I wrote 10, 11 years ago, entitled Jerusalem in the Quran. We have it in Bahasa. Huh? We have it tonight here in Bahasa. The Imam of Masjid India is translating it into Tamil. So good news for you. Good news soon in Tamil as well. That book explained the subject 10 years ago. Uh, Dajjal has already done so much and there's only this much left. Tonight we ask what is the strategy that he employs? Because Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam warned us about his strategies, his tests and trials, his fitna is the word used. That this will be the greatest fitna that mankind will experience from the time of Adam alayhi salam until the last day. And so Islamic scholarship at a time when the Dajjal is almost ready to complete his mission, Islamic scholarship must, must explain to the world what is that fitna of the Dajjal and how is he, what strategy is he using to be able to rule the world eventually from Jerusalem and to declare, I am the Messiah. And then the Jews will accept him as the Messiah. Hmm? And then of course we know after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send down Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Everybody believe that, all of us. And when he comes down, that's the end of the job. He finishes up. And history will end with the triumph of truth over falsehood and justice over injustice and oppression. So tonight we ask, what is the strategy that Dajjal is going to employ? And it is in that context that we're going to look for the first time at this hadith. I have in the past made mention of the hadith in passing. But tonight I hope to do it for the first time comprehensively, inshallah. So let us begin with Allah's blessed name. And pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may guide us and protect us from error. But let me once again enter into the record that any time your brother Imran Hussein gives an opinion or interprets the Quran or the Hadith, I don't want you to accept my opinion. No, not to do it. You must only accept my opinion when you are convinced that it is correct. Is there more I can do than that? I'm not brainwashing people, am I? How many times have I said it? This is my opinion and when I give an opinion, I say Allah knows best. And this is what Islamic scholarship has been doing for 1400 years. Are you going to deny me what scholars of Islam have been doing for 1400 years? Give an opinion and you say, Allah knows best. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that Dajjal will come with a mountain of bread and people will follow him for his bread. We have a problem of methodology here. The Salafi are my brothers. I am not waging any war on the Salafi. This is knowledge. This is the domain of knowledge and we are entitled to be critical. And so we ask, if you stay with that methodology, that only Allah and His Messenger and the Aslaf are entitled to interpret. And if they did not, then we have to wait for number one, a mountain, and number two, it must be a mountain of bread. The only thing we can ask is whether it will be whole wheat bread or bread made from white flour. And already my audience is smiling because they realize that there's more to the subject than that. 
Is it going to be the bread that you have in Roti Chennai? <laughs> no, no, we, we are not stuck with that methodology. No, we recognize that when the Prophet ﷺ spoke about a mountain of bread, that he's not talking about bread being piled up until it reaches as high as a mountain. No. We recognize it differently. We say mountain here stands for a large quantity or rather a very large quantity. And we say that bread here stands for wealth, material possessions. If you differ with us, that's your problem because we are moving on. This is our message to the world of Salafi Islamic scholarship. We are moving on. And we have been moving on last these last few months. And Alhamdulillah, there is appreciation for the progress being made. And so Dajjal is going to amass wealth. And there are those who are going to follow him for his wealth. Instead of being faithful to Allah and his messenger. You can buy them. You can buy them with the wealth that you have, Dajjal. What is the strategy that he uses to amass this huge amount of wealth and to then use that wealth as power, to use that wealth to be able to make progress with his mission to rule the world. That wealth is power. And if I have wealth, I can rule. And those who do not have wealth can be enslaved. And when they enslave, they cannot offer any resistance to my rule. So what is the strategy by which he amasses all of this wealth? We know about riba. Yeah. That the money lender when he lends you money on interest, does not always lend you money on interest so that he will become rich. If you have read John Perkins' book, John Perkins, thank Allah that he wrote the book. People would not have believed me, but now it's there. Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Try to get that book and read it then you know that the money lender sometimes lends you money on interest in order to enslave you. And so the banking system around the world, with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund at its heart, and the commercial banking interests, with which now, unfortunately, Islamic banks are also forming a part of it, so-called Islamic banks have played and are still playing a very important role in Dajjal's strategy of enslaving the masses around the world. But that's not our topic tonight. Our topic is the river Euphrates and the mountain of gold. And before we attend the subject, I have to tell you that your brother Imran graduated in 1971 from the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies in Karachi, Pakistan. My teacher and the head of the institution was Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah. And when I was leaving Pakistan, having done the degree in Islamic Studies and also a master's degree in philosophy from Karachi University, he said to me, Imran, I want you to go back home and I want your hand to be like this and not like this. Meaning, I want you to get a job and earn your own livelihood. Because he says, I know the character of the Ummah today. He who pays the piper calls the tune. Huh? So I went back home and I applied for a job in the foreign ministry. And they interviewed me and they said, yes, we'd love to have you in the foreign ministry, but we want you to go back to the university and do a uh, postgraduate diploma in international relations. And I got a chance to study international economics 
and in particular international, eco international monetary economics. Because I took the Quran with me in the classroom, of course in my heart, I had an advantage over all the others. So remember that when you have your children, eh? remember that with your children, that you educate your children. That I had in the classroom with me a fellow with a master's degree from the London School of Economics and people from French universities, the British universities, the Canadian universities, American universities. And they were all looking down at this poor Pakistani degree. He had a degree from Pakistan. <laughs> he studied Islam. What can he do? But at the end of the year, in the final year exams, I came first in the class. They didn't laugh that time. No. And in the, in the examination of international economics, I beat the fellow who had a master's degree from the London School of Economics. It was not just intelligence. It was not just hard work on my part. It was more than that. It was the Quran. It was because I had studied the Quran before coming to the classroom. But that was 1972, 40 years ago. It has taken me 40 years to understand now, today, what I studied then. And to be able to understand and penetrate this hadith about the river Euphrates and gold. Because I studied international monetary economics 40 years ago. I studied the Bretton Woods Accord. I studied the International Monetary Fund. I studied the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund. And I monitored international monetary economics over these last 40 years. And despite the fact that I had the Quran with me, I still could not understand what I now understand. Still could not. And so I could never make sense of this hadith until events had unfolded and India declared when the United States imposed the embargo financial relations on Iran banking system and then the European community followed suit you know about it in order to choke Iran that Iran cannot sell its oil and then India responded it was an embarrassment to me that Hindu India would respond what no Muslim government dared to do. None. These are supposed to be our leaders and you, these are the ones you go and you vote for in elections. India said to Iran, let's stop. And Iran agreed to sell oil for gold. And India agreed to pay for oil with gold. Thus bypassing the American embargo and the European the Zionist embargo. Russia and China are also following suit. And so in consequence of what they did, we are now witnessing, we are now on the verge of witnessing the end of something called the petrodollar. And I never understood until now the Jal strategy. But before we proceed, why did it take Iran, which is an Islamic revolution? The Shia are proud that they have an Islamic republic. Pakistan used to have an Islamic republic before it became an American republic. Huh? <laughs> so, <laughs> why did it take Iran so many years since the revolution? To understand the role of gold as money. Why? This actually is evidence of the dismal failure of Shia Islamic scholarship. The only ones who are worse off than the Shia in their Islamic scholarship is us, we, the Sunnis. Because at least they are now selling their oil for gold. Saudi Arabia will never do that. Not until Uncle Sam says permission granted Saudi. The Zionist state of Kuwait, of 
of Qatar will never do that. The Zionist monarchy of Saudi Arabia will never do that. None of these puppies of the Zionist world who today call themselves Muslim countries, none of them will do it unless the Zionists give permission to them. So tonight we take off our hats in praise for Iran, who defy them, and who because they are now prepared to sell oil for gold, that Saddam Hussein wanted to do. And that's why they knocked him down. That Muammar Gaddafi wanted to do. That's why they knocked him down. But if you attack Iran, it's different. You cannot attack Iran. Because if you do that, you're going to provoke world war. You're going to provoke nuclear war that will destroy the United States and Europe. And that's why the Americans do not want Iran to be attacked. You don't need a PhD to understand that. And so Shia Islamic scholarship, we're not proud of you. That you could not understand for so long, so long, so long, the role of coal as money in Islam. I was appointed as the principal of the Alimi Institute. I resigned my job in the foreign ministry in 1985 when I completed my contract. I didn't want to work as a, man, as a diplomat. And I went back to Pakistan and in 1986 they appointed me principal of the Alimi Institute, the same institute where I was a student. And in 1986, which is about 25 years ago, I proposed that the staff of the institute be paid their salaries in dinar and dirham. And the board looked at me as though I had fallen down from Mars or Venus or the moon. So our Islamic scholarship is worse off than yours. Now let's go back. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. One hadith in Sahih Bukhari I have found. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim, I have found four. Four. All from Abu Huraira. So it is mutawatim, it is also muttafakun ali. So you can't come and tell me this is da'if. No. He said that the river Euphrates will uncover or disclose or reveal a mountain of gold. In one version of the hadith, and people will fight over the gold. And 99 out of every 100 would be killed. And each one will be saying, I hope I will be the one who will survive. So of all the actors fighting over that gold, none of them knows who is going to survive. It's a guessing game. We know that everybody is going to be wiped out. Conventional wars do not result in 99 out of every 100 being killed. No. So our first response is that this has to be other than conventional warfare. It looks like nuclear warfare or some other kind of weapon of mass destruction that's going to come because we have not had that so far in that part of the world. No war which has taken place in that region of the world so far has, has destroyed 99% of all combatants. So this is a war which is still to come. Nuclear war. But he went on to say that the believers, the Muslims, must not take that goal. Must not take that goal. And so we ask tonight, as we did with the mountain of bread, is it going to be a mountain of the metal? We said that could not be a mountain of the bread, whole wheat bread. We understood it to be symbol symbolic language, religious symbolism. But if you insist on waiting on the mountain of bread, well, go ahead and wait. We're moving on. I am sending this message to Salafi Islamic scholarship and I'm not doing it with disrespect. <laughs> no. And I'm not doing it with boxing gloves. No. 
All I'm saying is that we defer with you. We defer with your methodology. And we're not waiting on you, we're moving on. And so we want to say tonight that we are not waiting for a mountain of the metal to come out from underneath the river and go up high into the sky. No. We recognize this to be religious symbolism. But not everything is religious symbolism, no. When the Prophet said that Nabi Isa is coming back, is that symbolic? What nonsense, no. That's actual, that's real. When he said he's going to get married, of course, I hope he'd marry a Palestinian girl, inshallah. When he said he's going to get married, he's going to have children. Is this symbolic? No. He said he's going to die. He said you are going to pray over his body. He said he's going to be buried next to me. Vatican could say what they want. The Pope could say what he wants. When Jesus returns, alayhi salam, and he dies, he's going to be buried next to Muhammad. Alayhi salatu wasalam, whether you like it or whether you are not, this is the Prophet of Allah. Is it not time for you to accept him? Is it not time for you to say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah, there is no God but the one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger alayhi salam so not all is symbolic no some is symbolic some, some are symbolic some are and you need spiritual insight to distinguish between the two so we are looking forward to mountain being a very large quantity but is it going to be gold the metal we say no we say something is going to come from that area where the river Euphrates is located. Something is going to come out in very large quantity which is going to play the role or function of gold. Which is going to function as gold. And we recognize that as oil. This is our opinion. You should not accept our opinion unless you are convinced that it is correct. What more can I do? But do I have the right to offer this interpretation? Try stopping me. You won't succeed. Because the evidence is already here around the world. Around the world, those who have been listening are accepting this opinion and not yours. When oil functions as money, the world will witness something called the petrodollar. And I didn't understand that. For 40 years, I did not. I have to confess tonight that when they sat down at Bretton Woods in 1944 and constructed this international monetary system, the plan was to ultimately reach that mountain of gold from the river Euphrates. But I did not understand it. No, I did not. What they did at Bretton Woods in 1944 was to construct an international monetary system that would officially replace dinar and dirham. Gold is now prohibited as money. Even Dr. Mahathir did not know that until it drew it to his attention. That it is hara, using our language, to use gold as money. This is what the Zionists did in 1944. But Allah made dinar and dirham halal as money. Even a schoolboy knows that. I wonder why Bank Negara doesn't know it as yet. <laughs> Would someone kindly inform Bank Negara for me, please? That Allah made dinar and dirham halal as money. <coughs> dinar is in the Quran. Dirham is in the Quran. Dinar and dirham are in the Sunnah. 
If you make haram what Allah made halal, is that a sin? If you make haram what Allah made halal, Allah made dinar and dirham halal, and your law prohibits dinar and dirham as money, okay? So you make it haram. Is that a sin? How come you're not bought? shaking your head and saying yes? Are you afraid? They can't arrest you. Too late for that. Yes, it is a sin. What kind of sin it is? Did you know? It is shirk. Yes, which surah of the Quran would you use? Surah to Tawbah is correct. Surah to Tawbah is correct. They took their priests and their rabbis as gods and lords beside Allah. Wal Masihatna Maryam and they did the same thing with the Messiah, the son of Mary. But they had not been ordered but to worship one God. La ilaha illahu, there is no God but him subhanahu. Amma yushrikun. Glory be to him, far removed is he from this shirk of taking your priest and your rabbis and worshipping them instead of worshipping Allah. Hmm? So a man came to the Prophet after this revelation came down and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, but the Christians do not worship their priests. And the Jews do not worship the rabbis. So how could Allah say so? That was the question. To which the Prophet ﷺ replied and he said, Did they not make halal what Allah made haram? That is their shirk. And did the people not accept it and follow it? That is their shirk. And so if you make halal what Allah made haram, that is shirk. If you make haram what Allah made halal, that is shirk. So what they did in 1944, the foundation of the system of money, the very foundation of this international monetary system was built on shirk. Up to this day, the muftis can't recognize that. Up to this day, the muftis will not stand up and say, this is shit. I don't know what else to do. We have been lecturing on this subject since before you were born, some of you. And yet the muftis will not stand up and declare this is shit. Why? They will have to answer one day. <laughs> they will have to answer one day. What they did in Bretton Woods was to say that this world of paper money is now officially replacing dinar and dirham. No more dinar and dirham is money. Only paper. But one paper, only one, the US dollar, would be chosen to be redeemable in gold. Meaning, you can take your US dollars to Uncle Sam, meaning the United States, and he will give you gold at the rate of $35 for one ounce of gold. But not the other paper money in the world, only this one. So what about the others? The Pakistani rupee, the Saudi rial, the Malaysian ringgit, Indonesian rupiah, Turkish lira, Venezuelan bolivar, Bangladeshi taka, taka. None of these paper money, none of these are redeemable in gold. No. Rather, they will have their value established on the basis of an exchange with His Majesty, the US dollar. Already. So you've given to the United States of America the ruling Zionist state in the world. You've given to the United States of America an extremely valuable weapon with which to establish its rule over mankind. How foolish have we been? 
How foolish have we been? We, we, the, the people who have other currencies, we cannot convert to gold, only the US dollar. Secondly, only governments could go to the United States with their US dollars to ask for it to be converted to gold. Individual people cannot do it. So this system is 99.9% .9 haram, apart from the shirk. Only 0.1% halal, in that if the government of Malaysia took 35 US dollars to Uncle Sam and said, we want to change, Uncle Sam will have to give the Malaysian Bank Nigara one ounce of gold. This system functioned from 1944 until 1971. The reason why it lasted this long was because nobody ever went to Uncle Sam to ask for their gold. During this period of time, the United States government was printing more dollars than they had gold, which is like writing out checks for 100,000 ringgits, checks, and you only have 10,000 ringgits. If you go to jail for that, eh? that's what the US government was doing, particularly to finance the, uh, the Vietnam War. They just printed the paper and they didn't have the gold to back it up. In 1971, I think it may have been the French government who having been inspired by Charles de Gaulle, there were two men who stood up against the system. Two. One was Charles de Gaulle and the other was Dr. Mohammed Mahatif. These two I know. So Charles de Gaulle stood up and declared this is unjust. This gives to the US dollar and the US government and the United States an unfair advantage over the rest of the world. And he denounced it. So in 1971, if I'm wrong, kindly forgive me, I believe it was the French government who came to the United States with a large quantity, maybe three billion US dollars, and said to Uncle Sam, we want the gold. Uncle Sam knew the game was up. The game was up. It was a game. Tomorrow night I have a lecture entitled, it's in Shah Alam, Pax Islamica, the Islamic conception of an international order. And tomorrow night you'll hear what kind of a world it could have been if we had Pax Islamica instead of Pax Americana. Tomorrow night your Quran will speak. Tomorrow night your prophet would speak to explain to you what is our conception of an international order or a world order. When we give our word, we keep our word. That's Islam, but not for the United States. So when France brought all of this money for, for dinar, for, I mean for gold, the United States said, we gave our word, but we don't have to keep it. Shame on you. Modern Western civilization, you gave us the United States of America. United States of America, you said you're the ruling state in the world and this is your immoral conduct. You gave your word, but you don't have to keep your word. Is this a feeble fit to rule the world? So they reneged on their obligations under international law to redeem the paper for gold at $35 an ounce. What I did not understand, even though I had studied international monetary economics, studied the Bretton Woods Accord, studied the International Monetary Fund, and monitored international monetary economics, what I did not understand and only now, praise be to Allah, I understand, is that this is what was intended to happen. They never intended at any time that this system which was constructed at Bretton Woods would remain like this. What they wanted was that mountain of gold. That's what they wanted. And they wanted that mountain of gold to function as money. And I never understood it.
And Islamic scholarship never understood it. At least I know of no one who has understood international monetary economics linked with this hadith. In 1971, they reneged, meaning they took Bretton Woods and the International Monetary Fund articles of agreement, they tore it up. And so now the United States is not backed, the US dollar is no longer backed by gold. No. So now the stage is set for the hadith to be fulfilled. It was a secret agreement. It came in the wake of the war of 1973, which means we have to put question marks now behind that war. Maybe there's more to that war <laughs> than we know. <laughs> King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, rahimahullah, imposed an oil boycott on the United States. Maybe someone whispered to him to do it, because they wanted him to do it. Because I believe in the sincerity of King Faisal, rahimahullah. Yes, I do. As soon as that oil boycott was imposed in the wake of the war of 1973, October 73, it was called the Yom Kippur War. Some of you may not have been born there. And the oil boycott was imposed by the Arab oil producing countries. Something happened to the price of gold. I was looking only at the value of the dollar. That's my mistake. I looked at the dollar and I saw that the dollar fell in value by 400% in its span of just one week. <laughs> This was correct analysis, but this is not the more important thing. The more important thing is that when the oil boycott was imposed, the price of oil soared from $40 an ounce, for $40 a barrel, to $160 a barrel. And the Arab oil producing countries, their eyes opened. Oh yes. It looked like a lot of greenbacks. A greenback is a US dollar. <laughs> that seems to have been... Yeah. yeah. That seems to have been an integral part of the plan. But after the Azan, inshallah, we'll continue. In the wake of the war of 1973, and the oil embargo, and the phenomenal rise in the price of oil, from, what was it? The price of gold rose from 40 to 160. I cannot remember the, the rise in the price of oil, but it's also a phenomenal rise in the price of oil, because oil was selling for four, five, six dollars a barrel hmm? prior to the war. The Arab oil producing countries suddenly realized that there is a lot of money to be made here. And the United States had a very crafty and cunning Secretary of State, a man named Henry Kissinger. The president was, what's his name again? Richard Nixon. Yeah. So Kissinger went to Saudi Arabia and Kissinger was successful I hope and pray that I'm not speaking unjustly of King Faisal Rahimahullah. If I am, may Allah forgive me. But this is secret negotiations and I don't have the records. So I'm reading between the lines that Kissinger was successful in convincing Faisal Rahimahullah. And when he convinced Faisal, Faisal realized that there's a lot of money to be made now. This is the deal. We want you to make a law that you will sell your oil for only US dollars. And Faisal fell for it. May Allah forgive him. From the time you decide that you will sell your oil for US dollars. You then went on to convince all the other Arab oil producing countries because they looked up to Saudi Arabia. And they all quickly agreed 
and OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, was then successful in establishing a rule for all member states of OPEC that we all agree that we will sell oil for only US dollars and that was the birth of something called the petrodollar and that is what they wanted at Bretton Woods but Imran didn't understand it. No. That was the ultimate prize that they wanted when they started in 1944 in Bretton Woods but I did not understand it. And now they have established something called a cartel, like a monopoly. A monopoly means you take control of the market and you fix the price. So no competition anymore in the market. This is haram. Even in American law, this is haram. <laughs> yeah. A man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I hope Bank Negara is listening. A man came to the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam and said, O Messenger of Allah, prices are too high. Impose price control. He said, no. The man came back a second time. The man came back a third time. Three times. O Messenger of Allah, impose price control. Fix the price. The Prophet said, no. Not in our market, not in the market of Islam. There is no such thing as price control. There is no such thing as fixed wages. There is no such thing as a minimum wage. I hope the Malaysian government is listening. Not in Islam. Islam gives to the world a free market and a fair market. And the market determines prices. No, you cannot say, Tetarik, this price, and put it up on the wall there. That's haram. Tetarik will be sold on the basis of the market price. Roti Chennai, this much. Haram. I wonder whether the Muftis know that. So there is no such thing as monopoly in our Islamic market. There is no such thing as a cartel. You cannot fix prices, you cannot control the market as producers, which is what OPEC has done. This is not Islam. No. Has any scholar, Salafi or Sufi, eh, denounced OPEC for violating Allah's law and the Sunnah of the Prophet? I'm not aware of it. And so now you have a controlled market. And forget it. The price of oil is no longer determined by the free and fair market. Forget that. The price of oil is now manipulated by those who control the market. And what they did with oil, they did with cocoa, they did with coffee, they did with sugar, they did with rice, they did with all commodities. They manipulate the market and they fix the price. It's no longer a free and a fair market anywhere in the world. It's a Zionist market of thieves. Is this what the Jewish religion gave you to the world? Not at all. You have corrupted the Jewish religion and you're destroying the Jewish religion. Now comes the interesting part of the subject. The price of oil has been going in only one direction since then. Have you noticed? It was six, seven, eight dollars a barrel. And then it went to 12, and then it went to 15, then it went to 20, then it went to 30, then it went to 40, then it went to 60, then it went to 80, 90, 100. It's more than 100 now. And all the time Imran thought it's a US dollar collapsing. Because I was only focusing on this part of the subject. And as the US dollar collapsed, went down in value, all the rest of the money in the world is going down in the value. If you think your Malaysian money, has the same value that it had five years ago. You're dreaming. Five years ago, you were richer. With the same ringgit in your pocket. And your ringgit has been falling and you don't even know it. So I was focusing on that part of the subject, not on this part. That's my mistake. The price of oil is going up and up and up and up and up. And that is not by accident. That's a part of the plan. 
That's why the Prophet said, believers must not touch that gold. From the time oil is sold for US dollars, the oil is now functioning as money. Where gold was functioning as money to back the paper, now oil is backing the paper. So number one, the US dollar is now given an opportunity to fly higher than it has ever flown before. Even while the value in terms of gold is going down, the United States is becoming more and more wealthy. It doesn't have to bother about any amount of gold in Fort Knox anymore. In order to make money, all you need is three things. You need a printing press, you need paper, and you need ink. And you can print and make as much money as you want. While those stupid fools, those ignorant fools, I don't know what Allah is going to do them, do to them on Judgment Day, including Imran Hussein. The scholars of Islam fail, fail miserably to even understand what is happening, much less to protest. What a colossal failure of Islamic scholarship in the contemporary world. Hmm? So the US dollar since 1973 now can fly more easily than it ever flew before. And the United States becomes more and more powerful. United States has a greater and greater capacity to rip off mankind and to advance its agenda of ruling the world. But that's not the only story. That's not all in days in the story. It's more than that. The Arabs saw the paper coming. US dollars, piles and piles and piles of the US dollars coming. Because the price of oil is going up and up and up and up. And the US dollar is the international money. But guess what? Henry Kissinger was smart. Faisal didn't understand that when you control the market for oil, which is haram, and then you keep on inflating the price, huh? it's going up and up more than any other commodity in the whole world market. Oil is going up and up and up and up. Oil is the biggest, the biggest, biggest thing so ma'am traded in the world market with the oil. Guess what happens to the rest of the world that cannot afford? Guess what happens to Egypt? and to Pakistan and to Bangladesh and to Indonesia. As Saudi Arabia and the Arab Gulf, Gulf states reaping and embracing more and more so many US dollars they don't know what to do with it. That part of the world is growing poorer and poorer and poorer and poorer. And the Zionists are sitting back and smiling while scholars of Islam eating roti chanai and drinking titari. And so our own people, the Arab oil producing countries, our own people, through the petrodollar system, have played a major role in impoverishing and enslaving their own Muslim brothers and sisters around the world to the advantage of the Zionists. That's why he said, don't touch that gold. If we had understood the Hadith, like we now do. What we would have done 40 years ago was to send a message to Muslims around the world. Let's start with one paper. Don't touch the US dollar. We're not going to buy the US dollar, not for nothing. And we're not going to sell for the US dollar, not for nothing because we understand the US dollar to be His Majesty, the King of the system of oppression and financial enslavement. Financial oppression and financial enslavement. And that would have helped us by beginning with the US dollar to then move on to the whole world of paper currency that we are not going to use it. We're not going to touch it. And we're going to come back and use our dinar and dirham. And you can do what you want. 
whether you are this government or that government or that government, we are going to return to the Sunnah. Whoever brings back to life my Sunnah, any Sunnah of mine, said Nabi Muhammad you will be my companion in Jannah. And here is his Sunnah, Dinar and Dirham, which has gone. And if we make the effort to bring back Dinar and Dirham, the implication is we can only do it by stopping the use of that bogus and fraudulent and haram paper money. Only then we are bringing back the Sunnah. So this is nonsense really. So many people now, even Chinese in Penang are minting dinar and dirham <laughs> and selling. And some of them are selling at inflated prices, eh? making a mint. So that those who are wealthy can secure this, the wealth that they have in dinar and dirham. While the bogus paper money continues to enslave the people. There's no barakah for that. We have suggested that we build Muslim villages in the remote countryside. And in our village, we have a market. And in our market, we are not going to use your ringgit. No, you can do what you want. You want to put us in jail? Go ahead and put us in jail. Shame on you. Shame on you. We're not going to use your ringgit. Do what you want. We're going to return to the Sunnah. And we're going to use dinar and dirham. If you stop us from using dinar and dirham, we're going to use rice as money. We're going to use sugar as money. Will you stop us from using rice and sugar as money? Shame on you! Shame on you! Shame on you! This is our plan to return to the sunnah. That's why he said, do not touch that bowl. Meaning, do not touch that petrodollar money system that's going to be used to keep the US dollar flying high and keep the paper money system surviving to this day. And only now, when India, which is a Hindu state, when India declares to Iran, we will buy your oil for gold, only now are we seeing the beginning of the collapse of the petrodollar money system. Only now. Not Islamic scholarship. It is India and Russia and China, not Salafi scholarship, not Sufi scholarship, no. I know of only one Sufi Sheikh. There may be others, I don't know them. I know of only Sheikh Nazim al-Kubrusi, who has been speaking for long years now about Dinar and Dirham. Only him. And urging all his followers to have at least 40 dinars in saving. This is years and years and years now Sheikh Nasim has been doing this. And today, for the first time, I heard, and alhamdulillah for that, that Sheikh Nasim has made an announcement, no one should declare him or call him a Sufi. He wants to banish the word Sufi and the, banish the word Tasawwuf. Alhamdulillah for that. We don't need this terminology when we have Al-Ihsan, which is in the Sunnah. But there is another reason why, he said, do not touch that gold. And let us explain that before we end. I believe there are two sides to it. It's not only the financial part, but also oil and the economy. It is not that oil is haram, that you should not use oil. No. It is that they are getting you to become dependent on oil to such an extent that your entire transportation system cannot work without oil. They don't want you to use horses anymore. They build their roads in such a way that you cannot use horses and donkeys and mules and cattle that Allah speaks about in the Quran. Agriculture today is dependent on oil through fertilizers. Manufacturing is dependent on oil for energy. And if you do not have oil and you have a modern economy, you're going to have riots. That's why he said, don't touch it. You're now going to see, maybe before the end of this year, why he said, don't touch that gold. Because once Iran is attacked, 
That's it. You see the price of oil skyrocketing to such a height that many will no longer be able to afford to buy. On the one hand, the price of oil is skyrocketing and number two, your value of your money is going down and down and down and down. So Bangladesh can't afford to buy it anymore. Pakistan can't afford to buy it anymore. Hmm? Well then how are you going to get away from the riots? Fidel Castro was very sensible. From the time they imposed the U.S. embargo on Castro, on Cuba, he began to modify the Cuban economy. And lots of people in Cuba use bicycles, so they don't have to have riots over oil. Hmm? Manufacturing in Cuba is such that they can live without the oil. But Pakistan has not done what Castro did in Cuba. Castro didn't have Islam. And so as soon as Iran is attacked and Pakistan is attacked, I think you're going to see why he said don't touch that oil. Because dependency on oil would have become total and complete. And you are no longer able to do without the oil. And you do not have an alternative. Even if we wanted to exploit solar energy, the Zionists did everything using the World Bank, using the IMF, to ensure that we do not succeed with the exploitation of solar energy to be able to get out of the trap of dependency on oil. And so once Iran is attacked, and the price of oil skyrockets beyond the reach of many in the world. And the value of money collapses tremendously. And many countries can no longer afford to buy the oil. Then Dajjal will say, if you want the oil, all you have to do is worship me. That's all. And you get all the oil you want. What does he mean? I'll tell you what he wants. You must extend diplomatic recognition to the state of Israel. You must allow an Israeli diplomatic mission in Dhaka and in Islamabad and in Kuala Lumpur. You must allow an Israeli ambassador to come <laughs> and live in KL. And they will all do it. All of these will do it. That's right. We don't have wait long to wait again. They'll all do it. And Dajjal will succeed and succeed brilliantly with his plans, his strategies, his tests, his trials. Did the Prophet Islam not war? Did he not war? He's coming with a mountain of bread. This is the bread. The vast wealth which has been accumulated. So they can have, it's called, uh, I've forgotten the word now, blackmail. Except that this one is not black meal, it's white meal, because the white, <laughs> the white world doing it. <laughs> oil black meal. That the only way you can get the oil is if you submit. Many have already submitted. Many have submitted already. We have offered to you an interpretation of this hadith. If we are correct, then your prophet has said to you, don't touch that gold. And you know you don't have to wait for a mountain of the metal. No. What he's saying to you is don't touch that system of money built on the petrodollar. Don't do it. And if you disobey Muhammad Islam, you pay a price for it. It could also mean do not become dependent on the oil. What should we do? The answer is, one mind is not enough. Maybe someone right here in this gathering, or someone who listens to this lecture, will take this topic and do a research work beyond what I can do because I don't have the time. On international monetary, the international monetary system, the river Euphrates and the mountain of gold. Do a PhD thesis on the topic. Come up with the research so that the world of Islam may benefit from that research work. And then we have to come up with strategies. What can we do to, to be able 
to faithfully obey our Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. I have offered one solution so far and that is to withdraw to the remote countryside to build Muslim villages. Already some of my students who are right here in this hall have bought land in Pira and are already clearing the land to move and start growing food crops and dairy farming and build some kampung house and live over there free from this haram, bogus and fraudulent monetary system. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may allow us to understand the alamat to saw better than we do. And pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us that we may be able to live in this world today and preserve our faith in Islam. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين